Friends, will you pray with me? Loving and most wondrous God, I pray that you once again let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our collective hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Open our ears to hear these words and know your voice. Speak to our hearts this morning and strengthen our understanding in the most unimaginable ways so that we may continue to serve you today and in the coming days. Amen. So as I spoke of before, at the beginning of this service, I, like many of you, I would suspect, and it's just a suspicion, did not grow up with the words eschatological, Eucharist, praxis, and now Transfiguration Sunday. So I didn't know these words and in divinity school, it was a little tough for me. And I didn't know there was a such thing even as a liturgical calendar. And now Lent comes every year and it's kind of old hat, right? We go into these seasons just like memory. It's part of who we are. But Transfiguration Sunday, that's still kind of a stretch, right? It's still kind of an odd thing. I didn't know what your A, B, and C meant or that the Vanderbilt Divinity School would become a research place and a resource for my sermon planning. This is the last one, Jojo, there you go. See, she's just kind of a part of us. She's gonna miss Sunday mornings now. But as a young Baptist camp kid, I had never really heard of many of these things, and certainly of this Sunday's topic, Transfiguration Sunday. So if you're like me, and this is all new to you, it's totally okay. And in fact, it's a beautiful thing to come to so many of these topics, and particularly this Sunday's text, and this moment with fresh eyes and an open mind. So with all of that being said, let's jump right in to this text and this dazzling moment to where we're situated this week. So this is the last week of the season of Epiphany. Lent begins this next week. Now for Luke, this, the transfiguration is in many ways the mother of all Epiphany stories. Now Epiphany means showing forth. Since it reveals Jesus as a prophet par excellence, right? And above all is God's chosen, God's beloved child. Now, if we read back a little bit, the verses preceding this passage in Luke, Jesus has just articulated what? What is arguably his most disturbing, difficult teaching of all? I know I'm in a different place. So Jojo is a little bit anxious this morning. So we're kind of going to have to work around her anxiety. I'm at my kitchen table. So she knows I eat here. He's teaching us that and the disciples that he must suffer, die and rise again. And that anyone who wishes to follow him, go lay down, go lay down here. YouTubers, I'm at home. Here you go. Fine. which means Jojo's at home with me. And that anyone who wishes to follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow him. Now the transfiguration light then acts as this kind of reassurance for Peter, John, and James, and as readers for all of us. And it's as if Luke is saying, we're now making the turn towards Golgotha. And that means descending into the valley of the shadow of death with Jesus. But Jesus is saying, but fear not. Keep this astonishing, mysterious mountaintop story in your mind as we go. Carry it with you like a torch, for it can help show the way. Because it gives us a glimpse of where all this is headed, right? By Luke's day, many of the Jews considered Elijah to be this figure whose return will signal the 
imminent end, right? So in that sense, Elijah was among the most prestigious of all the prophets. And Moses, of course, was thought to be the author of the Torah. So then what? Together, Moses and Elijah personified the law and the prophets, the sacred scriptural tradition, the risen Jesus will later interpret for the disciples on the road to Emmaus. So for those of you, us, that are still mystified, I'm going to define a couple of terms here. Transfiguration is said to mean what? Either A, to complete change of form or appearance into a more beautiful or scriptures or spiritual state, or what? Christ's appearance in radiant glory, like, right, glittery, white, to three of his disciples. So both things kind of happen here. And eschatological, meaning relating to death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of humankind. Do these definitions help? Maybe, maybe not, right? So above in the story, Elijah and Moses are dead biblical characters that are brought back to be in context with Jesus. They're important because of the Hebrew conversation. And the disciples know these stories well. They're Torah stories read over and over and over again. They're like Sunday school stories to them, right? Well, also Moses was also transfigured in his Exodus story, right? So he was, that story happened as well. So let's take a closer look at the scripture for this week. And the beauty of the lectionary this week is how these two texts, the Moses story from Exodus and the transfiguration story from Jesus happens from Luke. These two stories are woven together with this beautiful poetic narrative unique to these individuals, and yet they are so specific and godly, divinely connected. So in Luke, Jesus often retreats into the mountain, what? To alone, to be alone, and to pray. But this one time, he does what? He invites disciples, specific ones, right? It's kind of this first Christian worship service, right? He invites Peter, John, and James. And we know what happens when Peter comes along, right? Kind of a bumbling story, right? Peter does what? He kind of always misses the point, right? We know something kind of funny is going to happen, right? Peter, Peter's the guy who misses the point. So he's going to do something that's kind of, you know, it's, it's that missing the mark piece. So it's as if he has something to show them. So Jesus's shining face recalls Moses's radiance of his transfiguration story. So when he descended from Sinai, the episode, you know, it's like TV episodes that kind of recall other episodes. They're episodic. And in this week's reading from Exodus and Jesus's shining garments anticipate the heavenly white robes in what? an empty tomb to come from Luke 24, right? And also there's an episode in Revelations. So finally, the story's cloud and the divine voice also invoke the portrait of God's presence in Exodus 24. So in this way, Luke casts this mountaintop encounter with God in terms of Israel's classic paradigm, which is this gospel within a broad sweep of a salvation story. So what happens up there? It's kind of funny because it's beyond explanation, of course, right? But at the heart of it, it's this vision of a heavenly realm and indeed of the world to come. And I know they want to stay, right? Time, they, they build tents so they can stay, right? Time and space seem to collapse. The world is somehow incandescent. And Jesus is seen engaging two of the most prestigious figures in kind of collegial conversation, which would seem strange, right? What they're talking about is telling. The Greek word the NRV translates is departure, right? It's exodus. 
and likely a reference to his death, resurrection, and ascension. And at the same time, to the ancient idea of a new exodus modeled on what? Deliverance from Egypt. So imagine, friends, as we plan our promised land, our vision for the future, whatever we plan, if Moses or Elijah, Ruth or Sarah, or the people on our wall, right? Walking down our hallway where Debbie has done those beautiful um, historical documents of those folks that I've never met, those folks from the 18, 19, early 1900s showed up and them and I were having a conversation and someone just walked by. Well, what would we be thinking? It's that kind of a conversation, right? And we started talking about our ministry. How would onlookers, fellow disciples, feel about the sight that they were beholding? This is what Peter, James, and John witnessed. Jesus with ancestors of their faith. Right. I just did a 23 and me this week. So, you know, trying to find out about my because I only know half of my family story. So I'm trying to find out bits and pieces. I can't imagine that I'm going to find out the whole thing, but I'd like to find out some more of my story. Right. So imagine if I was having a conversation with some of our previous disciple ancestors and Miranda walked in and was like, wait a minute, those folks are from, you know, 19 something. And that's what's happening there. So we all know this guy, right? Peter, never at a loss for word, stammers at a suggestion. Let's build three tents, right? It's an endearing proposal, but it's a little bit tone deaf, right? Let's build three tents and they're in a heavenly realm, right? And it's a bit presumptuous. After all, if these three great prophets wanted a shelter, they probably would have likely made other arrangements. Is Peter thinking of a Greek custom of building a shrine at the site of a God appearance or of a festival of booths commemorating Exodus? Is he trying to corral the astounding wonder into something more manageable, right? You see something astounding. You have a God moment. You want to do something, right? But Peter is just trying to figure out something manageable. Or is he terrified, right? grasping for something to say, something to offer. Does he not have something to offer in that moment, right? Emanating from a cloud, God's voice reprises the message at Jesus's baptism, right? It may be that only Jesus hears that voice in that earlier scene. For there God says, you are my only son. Whereas here the announcement is addressed to all who have ears to hear. At any rate, even with Jesus's identity confirmed in spectacular fashion, the three disciples are stunned into what? Silence. For Luke, true to the Messiahship, comes not with trumpets and chariots, but rather in the deeply hidden form of a suffering servant. And accordingly, it only comes into the clear with what? The resurrection and ascension, the ultimate epiphany. So... Deep breath, the transfiguration does what? It ends as abruptly as it began. And the two older fi figures do what? They vanish. And the disciples find themselves with Jesus alone. And Luke's message here isn't that Jesus somehow eclipses or supersedes Moses and Elijah, but rather that he stands in profound kinship and continuity with them, both carrying and culminating their work. Now, finally, is this week's reading from Exodus, where Moses ascends or descends from the mountaintop and continues teaching his struggling disciples. The very next day, Jesus heals a body possessed by an unclean spirit. And Luke emphasizes that kinship with Jesus and Elijah by phrasing the story with a near quote from 1 Kings. Elijah took the child and gave him to his mother. Luke's message is clear. Jesus has come to heal and liberate. He's a prophet of the highest caliber. Heal what though, right? Our goal is at least, or at least mine, right? Here during the preaching moment is to be thought provoking or to offer an actual actionable moment. We read this ancient text because we believe that it has some contemporary application, right? I mean, if not, what are we doing here, right? 
We've been moved to tears this week by scenes in the Ukraine, right? I've had some calls that people needed housing, right? And what do we have to offer from our little church? There's heaviness in this world, right? We have folks that don't know where to go, don't know what to do, right? We're being called to vision for this church amidst our own transfiguration. And Jesus is certainly in our midst. There are places that are so holy, we might need to cover our faces. And have we recognized those holy places, those conversations and moments, right? When we see the glory, right? Where are the places that you have felt excluded? Where do you feel God calling you to invite healing? Because certain as Jesus said, death will come, his and ours. So will the moments of transfiguration, Barbara Brown Taylor calls it the bright cloud of unknowing, happen? Friends, the transfiguration comes and stops and fits and starts. God does not reveal God's self all at once. All we know is that it is revealed in tiny bits and pieces. And like Peter, sometimes we're going to try to build a tent or make lunch or do the wrong thing. And yet God or Jesus invites us in closer and closer and closer. And it is a mystery, right? But Jesus walks with us all the way, revealing God's self into dazzling wonder. And as we go into Lent, into this next wilderness experience, being called deeper into the wilderness before Easter, may our eyes be open to the experience. Amen.